on sus sustainable material <coughs> materials for packaging. Um, my name is Dana. I'm the knowledge transfer manager for synthetic biology at the KTN. So working with innovators in the space of um, engineering biology and also industrial uh, biote biotechnology. And um, we are hosting today's uh, webinar, Sustainable Materials for Packaging, which is part of the Bioeconomy Cluster Builder project. And this project is a collaboration with IBIOC and funded by the European Regional Development Fund. And you are going to hear a bit more about this project in a moment. Um, before we dive into the webinar itself, just a few um, housekeeping uh, rules. Um, if you have attended our KTN webinars before, they will be familiar to you. So you will have noticed that all participants are muted throughout the webinar. However, we really want to engage with you guys. So please use the Q&A box to submit your questions and we will answer them um, at the end of the webinar during our Q&A session. Should you have any technical problems, please use the chat box. Um, you can also use that if, if you just want to introduce yourself and talk to each other. And last but not least, uh, the webinar will be recorded and the link for the recording together with the presentations will be sent to you. So uh, coming to today's webinar, why are we here? Um, I'm sure we are all aware that the challenges we are facing around plastic, so plastic waste, recycling of plastic and the reuse of materials. And this is especially important in the packaging industry. And there's a huge need for alternative materials. So looking at a new bio-derived materials, bio-based ones, and also biodegradable ones. And those uh, new materials can really reduce the environmental impact across the packaging industry. However, to develop new materials, it's really important to understand the materials requirement. So what kind of properties are needed to replace existing materials and also to provide better materials. So this is why we are here. We have a really exciting uh, lineup of speakers to address really those uh, issues. So they are going to highlight um, the work they are doing in the space of uh, sustainable packaging materials, where they see the opportunities and what kind of materials they are developing. Um, the agenda is on the screen. So in a moment, I'm going to pass over to Russell, who is going to talk about the Bioeconomy Cluster Builder project. Then we are going to hear from our four invited speakers to talk about um, the opportunities they see in the space and to get their views. And then we are closing with my colleague Matthew, who talks about the funding opportunities in uh, the space of plastic packaging. And then we are going to have a Q&A session with our speakers. And we are hoping to uh, finish the webinar by 3.30. So, with this, I'm going to pass over to Russell, who is briefly talking about the Bioeconomy Cluster Builder project and how today, today's webinar fits into this uh, project. And then he's also going to introduce our speakers. Um, Russell, you. over Thank to you. Thank you, Dina. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dana. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So my name is Russell Clark. I'm a Senior Business Engagement Manager at iBioYC. I just want to spend a couple of minutes just talking to you about the remit of iBioYC, but also touch a little bit on the Bioeconomy Cluster Builder project. iBioYC was formed to help deliver the National Plan for Industrial Biotechnology in Scotland. Uh, we've got some stiff targets that were set as part of the plan which are aimed around delivery in 2025. Uh, we act as a hub between industry, academia and government. And this is really important because we're aiming to grow the bioeconomy in Scotland and ultimately reduce dependency on carbon intensive feedstocks and increase sustainable manufacturing. We use a number of tools to do this, including networking and events. We've got over 120 fee-paying members. We run a number of events. 
We also uh, delivered the largest industrial biotechnology conference in the UK, which is normally held in February. That'll be a virtual conference in 2021, so look out for that in terms of publicity coming up. We also offer a significant amount of funding, uh, project funding, and today we've had over we've had greater than 60 projects and four million pounds invested with 16 million additional leverage. Also, we uh, help to promote skills, uh, MSDs and HMDs facilitated through iBioIC. And we have open access scale facilities at Heriot Watt University and at the University of Strathclyde, up to 100 litres. Just to touch on the BCB project, in summary, it's a three year project which started in April of this year. And as Dana mentioned, the partners are iBioIC. KTN and Scottish Enterprise, and it's funded by ERDF. Our aim is to help iBioC promote the bioeconomy and net zero in Scotland and the wider UK. And target sectors, including chemicals, food and drink, marine and the agri sector, by engaging with relevant uh, and targeted events and workshops. We want to create a clustering effect and momentum to develop new supply chains in the areas of biotechnology where the largest impact can be expected. So as I mentioned, our main areas of activity are going to be company engagement through network development, stakeholder management, marketing, communication, events, many of which will be linked to funding, and you'll, feel, you'll hear a bit more about that later on, and project and bid opportunities. And we'll help to communicate that to our stakeholders. Finally, uh, just a slide which summarises the contact details for Dana and myself. So without further ado, I'd just like to introduce our first speaker, David Newman, and give you a couple of highlights about David's career. David is from Manchester with a first class degree in history and economics. He was the executive director of Greenpeace in Italy from 1994 to 97, and from 99 until 2014, he led the Italian Composting and Biogas Association. David founded and leads the Bio-Based and Biodegradable Industries Association, UK, since 2015, which works to promote the bioeconomy. He's president in, of the World Biogas Association since November 2016, co-author of the report, Global Food Waste Management, which is an implementation date for cities published in May 2018. He's a member of the Stakeholder Advisory Group at DEFRA and a chartered member of the CIWM. He also recently published a book which is titled Everything is Connected. David, it gives me a pleasure to hand over to you. Thank you, Matthew. Um, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and, and, and thank you for the invitation. I really very, very much appreciate the work that um, I, IBIOC do up there in Scotland. And um, it's a pity that with the pandemic, we're not able to meet uh, in person because I always enjoy the discussions uh, which we have together. Um, I'm going to try to give you today, ladies and gentlemen, a little bit of a, a sort of broader view of why we're here and what we should be looking out for in the broader sense, um, leaving for the other speakers to talk more about the specifics of their materials and the material use. Um, and the reason I'm doing this is because I often think um, that we are focusing sometimes on the wrong picture. Um, and this is because we are living in a time of really rapid transition. Um, if you think about the, the, the times we're living through, everything is moving so fast. And it's pretty confusing. And all the, when we talk about packaging, when we talk about materials, it seems that the, the wheels are turning, but they're not turning together. Um, and so the machine is not turning either. Uh, and everything is pretty confusing. Uh, so I want to try to help us understand the systems that we need in order to understand the materials that we need to get the cogs and the wheels turning together. There's a lot of variables, um, and the pandemic, of course, is the biggest of them and just adds to all those variables. Um, excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, I live in front of a very noisy building site, so I hope that you don't get too much 
um, background noise from it. Um, my apologies. So let's look at these variables, um, legislation, technology, how consumers behave, pricing of materials, and of course, what happens to them when we throw them away. Um, and we, we will see that there's one thing which unites all the variables and which flows through them. And we should also remember when we talk about variables that a lot of confusion is deliberate policy. A lot of sowing confusion is deliberate to slow down progress and to continue business as usual. Let's look at legislation. Well, you're all intelligent people, and I think I'm moderately intelligent too, but sometimes it's very, very difficult to understand what's going on. Um, when we talk about packaging materials, we have bans in some countries. We have plastic taxes in others. We have definitions which don't meet up. Is it biodegradable? Is it, is it compostable? Uh, what is bio-based? Uh, it's quite confusing uh, for specialists as well as for consumers. And of course, flowing through all this, we have changes in the way in which we uh, tax carbon, uh, in which we tax the externalities. And if we look around the world in, in different geographies, we see all different things going on. Um, China, for example, from 2021, will, will more or less ban single-use plastics, except for compostables. Uh, France and Italy have gone different ways down the route of compostable, compostable materials, uh, yet they're neighbors. Uh, in the US, you have some states uh, which have uh, banned the use of the word biodegradable um, uh, and, and, uh, and therefore use uh, the terminology compostability. Uh, in other states, that's completely ignored. You have oxodegradables and, and other materials all pretending to be biodegradable in the environment. In Africa, you have bans on things like plastic bags. Now, if I'm a brand, imagine you're selling I don't know, chocolate biscuits across the world. How are you supposed to cope with all this? It really is very, very difficult. But imagine if you're selling chocolate biscuits just across the UK. Under the single-use plastic um, legislation, which Wales and Scotland have put forward just recently, that may well be different to the single-use plastic legislation in England. How's anyone supposed to cope with that? It's really confusing. And then we have the question of technologies. Now, as most of you will know who know me, I can't tell one end of a brick from another, so don't ask me anything about technologies. But try asking policymakers to understand this. Try asking policymakers to understand that you can now make bioplastics from waste, even from CO2. Uh, try, to try to tell them that um, plastics with miracle additives in which claim to be biodegradable are not really biodegradable at all in anything like the time span that we need. Try explaining to them that actually it's not a problem with plastics because we've now got worms that eat plastic or chemical recycling that can take all the plastic that we need. Ah, it's easy. Uh, we've got compostable composites. Well, they're actually quite complicated. Um, and it's always, there's always the usual suspects out there. There's one fellow I know who's from the aluminium industry always talks about how the aluminium industry is better than all the others in doing all the jobs that we need for packaging. So that's confusing too. We have a lot of technologies. People in this webinar will be talking about that. Lots of options, but we rarely talk about where those technologies and where those materials fit. And we have consumers. Now, we're all consumers, and I do feel sorry for people who are not in our um, world on a daily basis and go to the shops and come away with packaging and no, don't know what to do with it. Um, brands are pushed by consumers to do better. But do consumers understand what better is? Do they understand the complexity? I bet they don't. Uh, we have a, a survey of 4,000 people saying that 85% of them love compostables and we want to have compostables everywhere. But we don't have the collection systems yet for those, do we? Uh, are consumers really those paragons of vir virtue that we think they are? I don't think so. I think probably most of us are generally quite lazy. We don't always do the right thing. Uh, for example, refill systems. Well, they've been around. I've seen refill systems around now for 20 years, but they've never caught on because actually it's quite difficult to think I've got to go to the shop with lots of empty bottles. It's probably not going to happen on a big scale. And at the same time, people are price conscious. 
they will look at two packages and they will look at two materials and two products and they will probably choose the one that is cheaper. So brands and retailers are under pressure but are confused as to the direction because consumers are confusing them too. And in this, often it's simpler just to do nothing but to pretend you're doing something by engaging, by talking about recycling and how sustainable you are, etc. We've seen lots of that. But then there's pricing. Well, anybody in the packaging industry will know better than me that no material can compete with plastics. Virgin Pet has declined in value two thirds since 2018, 2017. I estimated in 2018 it would go to $800 a ton. Even I was um, not ready for $600 a ton coming out of China now. So when you talk about alternative materials, you cannot compete with plastics. Therefore, you have to look at alternative materials in the uses where they make sense and where plastic does not make sense. Because a brand, if you're a price conscious brand, why would you use anything else than the cheapest material? And by the way, plastics, we all know, work just fine until we have the problem of disposal. And of course, ignoring greenhouse gases and of course, ignoring toxicity. But if you're packaging something and you're selling it to consumers, well, why do anything else when it's so, so, so much cheaper? And then, of course, consumers have to throw it away. Well, this is the biggest mess we have. This really is the critical end of pipeline, which is just not functioning. Plastics recycling market are dead, but also, apart from high quality, paper markets are struggling too. Now, I, I got a degree in economics. I predicted this 10 years ago. It's, it's just so obvious. It's 101 economics. If you don't throw loads and loads of money at recycling to make the cost of recycled products competitive with the cost of virgin products, it's going to fail. And it's failed. Uh, chemical recycling is 10 years away. The Americans are talking now about shipping their plastic waste to Kenya. That's what they mean by recycling. I think that's a criminal activity. Um, Export markets are rapidly closing down. We saw yesterday or last week that Turkey has announced it's going to ban the imports of, of, of uh, waste from uh, other countries. And whilst we know that recycling of plastics particularly is a scam that has been put out by the major plastic producers to cover the fact that they are actually putting materials onto the market and taking no responsibility for them whatsoever, we still insist on talking about recycling. Are we stupid or something? Don't we get the message? So the future in the waste and disposal markets is incineration, is the reopening of landfills, is the illegal burning of waste in deposits, warehouses all across Europe. Hundreds and hundreds of them go up in flames every year. I track this with a group of people. Hundreds of these deposits go up. Miracles, miraculously self-combust. Well, of course, it's just a way of getting rid of waste uh, that nobody wants and that can't be recycled anymore. But there is some good news in all this, and it's good news for compostables, and that is that food waste collections are coming across the whole EU. Now, I know in Scotland, you're ahead of the game. Uh, here in England, we have to catch up. But food waste collections are a route back to treatment for compostables. Well, we talked about variables, but there's one constant, isn't there? Money flows through all this. Money is the problem because it's flowing in the wrong way, but money is also the solution because it can be made to make systems work. And this is where we all want to go to, isn't it, ladies and gentlemen? When we talk about the circular economy, when we talk about the future, we all want to go to this system here. Um, and I don't know if you can see the, the graph on the on the you can see the notes on the right there, maybe. Yes, no. Um, the, on, the, on the left of your screen, you have the biosphere. Well, this is really quite difficult to understand for policymakers. They really don't understand that you can make materials that can go back to soil and actually re help replenish the biosphere. But they do understand it because as kids, we all played around with Lego, we played around with building bricks, so we understand the mechanosphere. We can understand that putting things together and remaking them and 
and all these bits and pieces grinding. Well, it's easy, isn't it? You can take a radio apart and put it back. You can take your car engine apart and put it back. You can understand that. But it's actually quite difficult to understand that your banana skin is the future, not only of energy, but is also the future of soil restoration. People just don't get it. And therefore, the, the policies and the investments going to the biosphere are far, far uh, inferior than the policies and the money going to the mechanosphere. But I would argue that the biosphere is far, far more important. And we are wasting a huge amount of money putting those funds and resources into the recycling of materials, which actually um, are sometimes unnecessary. We're misallocating our spending. For example, in our country here in the UK, um, we are still giving huge subsidies and tax breaks and VAT breaks to fossil fuels and therefore also to plastics. Well, we saw already that plastics, you can't compete with them, but not only can't you compete with them, we subsidize them. And we're fighting climate change, so we subsidize fossil fuels. And you think human beings are intelligent. Um, we are um, subsidizing energy production and therefore against material recovery. For example, we give huge subsidies to anaerobic digestion. Great, I'm the president of the World Biogas Association. But we give no subsidies to organic carbon to go back to soil, for example, through composting. We subsidize farmers so that they can use damaging chemical fertilizers and therefore accelerate soil degradation. But we don't give any subsidies to saving our soils from that same degradation, from that same erosion, from getting organic carbon back to soil. And beyond biogas, we don't subsidize the biocycle. But the circular economy on both sides, the biocycle and the mechanics, mechanical cycle, has a cost. It's not for free. So what do we need to do? Well, firstly, I think we need to establish what our aims are. What do we want? Well, we have single-use plastic directives, we have circular economy packages, we have waste targets. And so I would argue that we have essentially to focus on two aims. One is to dramatically reduce the amount of plastic that we use and plastic waste and ensure that the money is there to collect and treat it in a benign way for the environment. That we are not doing. This is 2020. This is not 1980. It's shameful that we cannot even do that. And the second aim, I would argue, is perhaps more important, and that is to ensure that our soils are replenished by organic carbon. We're losing 3 million tons of topsoil through farming activities in the UK alone every year. And we can put compost back to soil to replace that. So we need to promote equally the biosphere and the mechanosphere. Now, Plastics, the plastic packaging, contaminates the biosphere. I estimated in a webinar with the European Commission just two days ago that the cost of contamination of plastic waste to food waste collections in the EU post-23, when all EU countries will have food waste collections, will be around 2.5 billion euros a year. And compostable plastics can help de decontaminate the biosphere of those plastics and they should be kept out of the bio, uh, mechanosphere. They're separate systems. The biosphere is the system we live in. It produces our food, our water, our soil, it cleans our air. And frankly, ladies and gentlemen, whether we recycle a ton or a million more tons of plastic is completely, I would say, irrelevant to the human future, to our survival. We can't eat it. So we should be asking ourselves when we talk about these things, what systems do we need to promote? Where the materials fit into that system? Are you making a material for the mechanical or for the biocycle? Where, what, what will all this cost? Getting the biocycle right, who's gonna pay? What's the role of EPR in this? What's the role of taxation? How do we allocate that money? Do we want more money to go to food and the survival of humanity or do we want more money to go to plastics and a little bit more recycling? These are the subjects which we should be debating. Materials and the technology come afterwards once we decide upon the systems. I'm coming to a conclusion, I think I'm running over time, but Carbon Tracker gives us a really clear idea of what the costs of plastics are to the global economy. 
It's a lot of money, $350 billion a ton uh, uh, a year, about $1,000 a ton. And so we have to think about the systems we live in. Mechanical systems, the mechanical recycling of plastics, etc., does not fit into the biosphere. Biosystems, the organic recycling, bioplastics, compostable plastics, don't fit into the mechanosphere. But the biosphere, ladies and gentlemen, is essential for our survival. And that's where our focus should be. So this is the wood we need to see from the trees. We need to ensure that those plastic virgin polymers coming into our country, into our market, are taxed so that they can pay for the environmental damage they're causing. And we use that money to promote reduction policies, prevention policies, refill systems. Yes, some recycling where it's possible, pet bottles, for example, and alternative materials like our compostable materials we're going to hear about today from other speakers. And promote the recovery of the biosphere, which is heavily stressed. We see it everywhere. That means promoting the bioeconomy, but it gives a possibility, a real possibility of reducing waste and costs to citizens for the disposal of the enormous quantities of plastics that we have today. So unless we face the challenge of the economics of plastic use, we're not going to solve the problems. We have to have a systemic approach. And so lastly, opportunities for Scotland, where you've, you've got a lot of things going for you in Scotland. Uh, not least the government that listens, rather than uh, the governments we have uh, down here, which seem not to listen to, to what's going on. Great legal system, you're open to international markets, you have great research, and I love the work that IBOC is doing. Uh, you've got uh, feedstocks there coming from and going to fish farming, great opportunities. Uh, and of course, you already have food waste collections uh, and so quite high on the agenda, uh, and abundant feedstocks to make new materials. What's missing? You're missing, as we are, are in most of, of Europe, policy pools that create the marketplace for these materials to thrive and grow and go beyond innovation to become industries. Are we going to, um, innovative materials going to save us? Well, I'm not going to bet on it because unless we act, we're still being swamped by waste. And there are people you talk to every day who really want that situation to continue because confusion means business as usual. Don't get distracted by the materials. Look at the money. Who makes it, who wants it, who keeps it, and how we should get the money to sort out the plastic packaging disaster. We have the polluters pay principle, but we don't apply it. And remember that compostables will not solve the problem of plastics. They fit into the biosphere. And anybody who says that compostables are a substitute for vast quantities of plastic doesn't know what they're talking about. Thanks very much. And there's the link to the book, by the way, where you'll see a lot more of these uh, issues discussed. It's been a pleasure to talk with you, and I'll be here for the questions and answers shortly. Thank you, David. That was uh, an excellent talk and really thought-provoking. I'm sure you'll get some interesting questions later. So, if we could now move on to our next speaker, Martin Murray, the founder of Dunham Bay Distillery. I should say at this point that Martin can only join us for his presentation, and so He's already indicated that he'd be happy to take questions at the end of his presentation. Martin was born in Thurzo and grew up in Caithness, and that's a theme that you'll see if you look at the Dunnett Bay Distillery website, which I would encourage you to do. Um, in 2004, Martin was awarded an MEng in Chemical Engineering from Heriot Walk and spent the next 10 years in oil and gas with BP in total. In 2013, Martin, along with his wife Claire, founded Dunnett Bay Distilleries and made the first batch of Rock Rose Gin in 2014. Martin is the technical mastermind behind the business and is looking forward to embarking on new gin adventures in the future. Martin, it's over to you. Thank you very much, Russell. I'll just get my screen shared for you all. Okay, hopefully that's all worked out. Good afternoon. Um, I think you'll agree that the presentation by David was absolutely amazing, really inspiring for someone like, like myself who's 
uh, trying to improve our business, trying to uh, direct our business for future years. It's, it's just a real eye opener. Um, I'm delighted to talk today um, about our wee family business. Um, I wonder if you can put our business into context about our size. So I'm going to do an introduction to our business, who we are, um, how we started life, what we've kind of achieved, and then talk about the refill project. So uh, David's uh, comments are really uh, interesting. There's a few things that I can talk about that will uh, show the kind of things we had to, barriers we had to knock down, things we've tried to do to incentivize refills and um, returns of refills. And then also a little bit about our future plans, which um, uh, are already underway and um, yeah, really hopefully quite interesting. So done at bay, well, uh, this is home. First and foremost, this is uh, where I was brought up, Thurzo, eight miles to the west. Claire, my wife, the other co-founder of the distillery, um, it's from the village of Dunnet. This is our family home village of about 300 people, very rural, very fragile. Um, the main, um, main business up here has been the Dunry nuclear test facility, which is now in a period of decommissioning. Um, there's a lot of work now looking to establish alternative business. And uh, we did that. We, we set up a distillery on the north coast of Scotland so that we could move home and raise our family in such a wonderful uh, location uh, with all our friends and family around us. Um, we are the most northerly distillery and um, I don't think we'll be pipped soon because we're right up there near Dunnet Head. Give you an idea of scale, we're not a huge multinational distillery. We're still independently owned. It's myself and Claire that own the business. Uh, we started life in six years ago where um, we wanted to transition out of oil and gas, to transition out of roles and uh, do something uh, that was more sort of close to our hearts and also to create two jobs for ourselves. That was in reality the only way we could move home was uh, to create jobs. Most of our, uh, a lot of our friends move to university, move to other work and never come back. Uh, th the only chance for us to really come back to Caithness and raise a family was to start a distillery. So we've built a distillery uh, six years ago, expanded the warehouse um, to the side there and also built, built a visitor attraction and tasting room in that old steading. Um, the distillery is now uh, powered by a 22 kilowatt solar system. We're currently generating more uh, electricity from solar than we use in a year. Um, we have from day one um, always uh, been spreading our waste, our botanical waste and our uh, liquid distillation waste onto fields with uh, approval from SEPA as a benefit to agriculture. So, from our process, we've been able to avoid landfill with those ingredients, but also to try and uh, improve uh, the soil on local crops. We use a burn that goes down the back of this site to uh, cool the process. Um, we keep that um, tightly controlled so that it returns at a temperature close to the supply temperature. And that allows us to avoid using treated water as a cooling source. Our capacity at the moment is around about 150,000 bottles per year. So there'll be distilleries that will be doing that in an hour, but we're very much a hands-on uh, business that has created 16 jobs. And we do everything in-house from the distillation through to the bottling and dispatches. Again, there's a scale of the site. We have a gardener who's worked from us from day one. She has developed the garden so that we grow a lot of the botanicals we use. Um, for our seasonal additions on site. Um, we also compost a lot of the waste that we produce from our additions on site as well. Um, it's a very small site, we're running out of space. We're looking to uh, build a new facility in the coming years. And again, we want that to follow our, um, our, our, our existing facility where we have a very low impact um, on the environment. We want to uh, use sustainable fuels and try to develop the facility to the next level. Here's some of our um, spirits to give you an idea in case you've seen them. So we've got Rock Rose, Holy Grass, and then the seasonal editions of Rock Rose. We export to 21 countries. We have a deal in the US. We distribute to around about 20 states in the US. 
um, and I've done that pretty much um, on my own through uh, traveling to trade shows and uh, managing that in-house. Um, some of the achievements, we've sold our first batch out 40 hours, that was a thousand bottles. Batch two, the same, another thousand bottles in 24 hours. Uh, first year's production gone in the first 14 weeks. And then we've um, developed a, a lot of innovative prod products where uh, in terms of flavor profile, we've done the UK's first and only Burns gin, Lassie's Toast, we've done the UK's first and only grass vodka. That vodka is um, created using holy grass, which was first found growing on our local river. Uh, we now grow that on site uh, with a gardener and use that in, in the vodka. Uh, as I said, we use the seasonal gins. Um, we won a number of awards and uh, last year we were, we were uh, given the great pride of being Scotland's best gin distillery at the Scottish Gin Awards. Now moving on to the, I guess, the interesting part, which is our refill project. When we designed our bottles um, seven years ago, we wanted a beautiful product. We wanted something that would stand out on the shelf and give us a point of difference. It wasn't very much a crowded gin market back then, but it certainly is now. And doing that really did give us uh, something that was catching on the eye and helped with our sales. But one thing we realized um, after selling the gin was that customers wanted to keep the ball. They didn't want to recycle it. They didn't they want to do um, anything other than upcycle or reuse. So upcycling, we developed some ideas. We were able to sell soap pumps and um, do tutorials on how the bottle could be upcycled. But there's only so many projects you can do with upcycling. We found partners who would create lamps. And um, again, that um, helped, but it didn't really... Um, address all the bottles that were going out. So in 2017, um, I approached Highlands and Highlands Enterprise to ask about developing a refill uh, concept for a bottle. Um, at the time, it was clear to me that I wanted the project uh, or the product to be fully recyclable um, for our customers. And I knew at the time that there was going to be certain barriers that would stop the recycling or stop the purchase. And I took that part in-house. So we launched that project 2017. It ran over, I think, six, six months. Um, and we identified different concepts that would work. Um, and we were thinking about terms in terms of practical um, things, like how easy it would be to refill bottles, how easy it would be to post, um, and also how pleasing it would be on the eye because we'd create a beautiful brand. We wanted to have something that um, met all the criteria of being fully recyclable, but also be in keeping with what we are as a business. Um, in 2018, we fully funded the second phase, which was around about £35,000 to develop a concept and take it to working prototype. Initially, we planned on doing a thousand pouches um, after identifying the best materials, best manufacturer, and then ironing out the barriers um, to using uh, this concept. Um, so we funded that. Uh, we successfully identified a partner. We successfully identified a fully uh, recyclable recycling route uh, for the pouch and then we took on Royal Mail. Um, one of the things that I was conscious about was that um, any barriers to recycling this pouch or returning this pouch um, would mean that it would fall over probably at the first hurdle. So we challenged Royal Mail technically to allow us to print the free post address on the back of the pouch so that it could come back to us in exactly the same uh, way that it had gone out. You know, it would come back a pouch with a cap and we would take control of that waste stream. Now, what I mean is we obviously have to fund that, but the advantage for us is that we were then able to measure recycling return rates. We were then able to um, knock a barrier down, you know, the, people using the pouches could return them without having to find an envelope, without having to find a stamp, or even having to write the address on the pouch. So that, um, we believe, would help. Um, secondly, we knew that price would be a bar. We had to incentivize this. So we discounted the pouches by um, over 10% so that there's a, 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 a reason for customers to buy the pouch and do it there. By being a re refill user, you would save money. Um, and also um, help us with our project. In February of this year, we really tried to scale up the project. We installed uh, 
one of two of Europe's only desktop pouch fillers to suit our scale of business. And this was going to allow us to scale up um, the business uh, of the pouches. So um, we scaled up the original edition that we launched in 2019. And it was our best seller in March, April and May during lockdown. People really embraced the refills um, during those months. Um, just two weeks ago, we launched the refill subscription service to, um, to include the entire range. Again, this is incentivizing customers to sign up to a refill scheme that would give them tonics, snacks, and a free gift and free shipping if they were committed to being um, on our refill scheme. We would allow them to change uh, the product on the scheme, on the scheme and um, we've seen that as being a real benefit. To give you an update, we sold out the first 250 allocation, which uh, was a stretch target for us. We sold that out in two weeks and we're now taking orders for the next uh, kind of additions to the scheme for next month. There's a pouch. Rains, they look great. They are in keeping with the brand. They, uh, most popular is the original edition um, and now we're seeing people signing up for all of these um, this month. We created a short video as well so that we could educate customers on what it meant and how it worked. It takes a minute, I'll talk you through it um, when we do it. Um, really this intention was again to try and get it in front of people on social media so that we could tell them what we're doing, what the advantages were for them and also how easy it would be for them to get the pouch back to us. Now, it's really interesting. We're um, going to be taking, um, replacing bottles with these pouches. And you would say that bottles are um, a plastic free product, but our, our bottles come in from Germany, a thousand bottles at a time wrapped in just under a kilo's worth of plastic that is non-recyclable. We did a project with Strathclyde University to see what we could do with it and um, it, we failed. We, we couldn't find, identify a way to uh, use that waste stream. So this video is showing people how to refill the picture, how to refill the bottle. Very quick introduction. You pop it into the letterbox, no stamp or envelope required. That was a key point for us. And then they come back to us and we take control of it. We collect them, we measure how much we get back. And then um, it allows us to identify if it's working, if it's not working and uh, how we can put things in place um, to try and improve that. So benefits of this project to us, uh, fully recyclable project uh, product, de decreased our packaging weight from our, a bottle weight of to 750 grams to 12.6 grams. It's a massive reduction in weight. Meant that we could ship more um, for less, so our, our shipping charges came down. Um, as you can imagine, bottles do get broken in transit, but with the pouches, we've not had a single breakage. Um, and it's also reduced our carbon emissions uh, from shipping. A pallet now um, that we ship uh, has been reduced from 1,400 kilograms down to 650 kilograms, so it's not insignificant. Now, we developed this for the UK market. We were very much focused on how we could do this in the UK market, but it's been embraced and um, other countries where uh, our distributors are looking for uh, ways to do a refill concept and uh, to work partner with us have been successful too. So we've part partnered with companies in Germany, Australia, um, Singapore, New Zealand and Japan. So it's starting to prove to be a concept that's working in other markets. But it's challenging. As David mentioned, There's a, every market that we're in has its own um, problems, challenges, and then also ways, other ways of doing things. The other advantage to us as a business is it's reduced storage space. We can fit 40,000 pouches into the same space as one pallet of bottles. Um, so that means we can, um, it takes up less space, it makes it a lot easier for us, uh, it makes our space a lot more efficient. Um, since we launched the pouches in, um, February, or uh, when we actually start to push some more, it's been our best selling on our product on our website. And this year we sold twice as many pouches as we have uh, bottles on our website. Our return rate at the moment is 70%, which I don't think is good enough, um, but we're measuring that. We're trying to incentivize it. We're thinking of clever ways to reward people who re return um, 12 pouches over a year. 
and um, we're willing to do that because we very much see this as the right thing to do and something that uh, we want to be seen to be uh, promoting in, in the long run. But this project also had benefits to us. It, um, it raised awareness about what we were trying to do as a business. As you can imagine, we struggle to get in front of people because of our location. It's a long way from Dunnet to our big markets. Um, so in the press, we were able to get some uh, coverage about what we were doing. On the right hand side, you'll see a photo of me where I won two weeks ago the Director of the Year at the IOD Scotland Awards for Innovation, um, which was uh, because of the work we'd been doing in the, uh, for the refill pouches. Future, uh, okay, so we've got a slight complication, which we always knew about, which was um, the duty scheme is very complicated and uh, hasn't been updated in line with the pace of progression. At the moment, we can sell these in shops online, uh, but we cannot uh, put them in bars and offer the refill service to bars. And that's where we will win because bars go through bottles so much more quicker. They have uh, less space to store waste. Um, their general recycling rate of bottles is pretty poor. We're hoping to win the challenge with HMRC to be able to offer that in the on-trade this month. It's just a shame that the on-trade is not um, where it would normally be at uh, because of uh, the current situation with COVID. And then um, later in the year, we want to create a fully compostable refill pouch. Um, we want to work with expertise in packaging you know, that can advise us on what that um, concept should look like and how it should work. We want to make sure that it fits in with our uh, idea of offering value to our customers, but also um, uh, being fully compostable and of benefit uh, to or not detrimental to the environment. That's something that we will outsource. We know that we don't have the in-house expertise to do that. Um, we used consultancy before with the Hangzhang Enterprise and we would look to do that again. Um, and again, it's just a step Everything we improve here at the distillery isn't a final solution, it's a step to the next solution. And that's very much the way I view uh, this business and our, our project. That was a quick run through of our business and our project. Um, I've left my contact details there, I've got to rush off. My wife's um, laid up at home with ligament damage, so I'm having to uh, do all the nursery runs and uh, school runs at the moment. But Please feel free to contact me on that email address. I'm happy to share information. Um, I believe that anything that is to the benefit of the environment should be openly and freely shared. And we've done that with this project to other businesses. Um, and I don't mind sharing final reports and impact. So uh, please feel free to contact me. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Martin. Hi. I think it's one of the occasions where I really regret not having a face-to-face -face meeting. So we could have some samples, you know, from your distillery. Um, unfortunately, Martin, as you said, can't stay for the Q&A. So please, if you have any questions, put them in the Q&A box now. Um, we have one from Catherine. Um, Catherine, if you can please unmute yourself. Yes, I have. Hi, I'm Catherine, one of Dani, Dana's colleagues on the project. I'm working at the KTN as well. Firstly, congratulations to you and your wife. Absolutely loved that presentation. And not just because I like gin, which I do, but that was so inspirational in terms of the business model and how you guys are moving forward. And we just need more people like you. Amazing. So I was just wondering if you had any other collaborative projects planned for the plastic wrapping uh, for the original bottles. And if not, I would be happy to talk to you online to see if the KTN can introduce some, um, you know, potential project partners, um, because I think that would be the missing link. That would be great if you could find an alternative for that. Yeah, thank you very much for the kind words. This is something we have explored and we're looking at returnable um, covers. So essentially the bottles would be shipped to us with these covers on, they would hold the pallet in place and then we would ship them back to Germany so that there was then a plastic free alternative. At the moment, there's quite a high uh, rate of these things that go missing. So they're quite expensive to buy up front. And then if they lose, if they go missing, then you're kind of you're out of pocket again. But we are very, very keen to solve this problem. So I welcome a conversation offline and any ideas. Fantastic. So I'll be in touch um, probably tomorrow, <laughs> Martin. Thank, thank uh, you very much. Good luck with the nursery run. <laughs>
Okay, um, thanks, Martin. I can't see any comments in the Q&A box. Um, I said um, Martin put his uh, contact details in the presentations. We will share the presentations after the, the webinar today, and then you can get in contact with uh, Martin directly. So, um, Russell, oh, hang on. I think we just have one coming in. So there is a question from Nico wanting to know how much the transport of the empty pouches contribute to the cost and the environmental impact. So how much, what, what, which cost, sorry? The cost for the transport. So if you think about transporting the empty pouches, you know, for the post delivery, picking them up and transporting them uh, back to you guys, how much impact that has on the env environment. Uh, oh gosh, that's a good question. Um, I'll have a look into that. We do have, I've got a lot of num numbers bogging in my mind at the moment because we have all, all the costs we're shipped in and we've got the saving in a report. If Nico wouldn't mind, I'll drop him that, I'll drop the final report in the email and um, share that offline. That's uh, no problem. I just, uh, I don't have it at the top of my head at the moment, I'm afraid. Yeah, and there's another question, similar one, I guess. If you have considered the reuse of the pouches instead of recycling them. Yes, absolutely. So um, it's a slight challenge with uh, the environmental health department here. So uh, it was the same with the bottles. It's actually, it's more challenging to reuse them than to use new ones, but we're working on it. So we would have launched an in-store refill for bottles this year, but COVID stopped that. Um, but we are looking to give people their own named pouch and that would allow us to do two things that would allow us to reward that person for being a continual user so we can measure their pouch coming back um, and also it would allow us to just use less pouches they'd have one per person and that again would be a great solution so that is very much the one of the next kind of phases for 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 the pouches and and that but we are held up with a little bit of um legislation which really shouldn't apply to spirits but we're working on it okay um i think we need to let you go martin uh, thanks again for your really exciting presentation and i'm sure some people will be in touch with further questions or even to try some of your gin and um yeah russell if you want to introduce the next yep. speaker please yeah thank you martin i know you're very very busy so uh thank you very much for your time and your excellent presentation this afternoon Okay, so we move on to our next speaker, Ricky Speakman from Diageo. Ricky graduated with a degree in pure and applied chemistry from the University of Strathclyde in 1993. And as a mature student, graduated with a master's degree in material science from Edinburgh, Napier University in 2012. Ricky worked for seven years as an analytical chemist at Bosch and Lomb in Livingston, before moving on to carry out the KTP with Glasgow Caledonian University and Highland Colour Quarters in 2011. Since then he's worked in the quality department at Tockheim in Dundee and the R&D department at Frank Kitchen Systems in Falkirk before joining Diageo as a packaging technologist in the Global Supply Chain Technical Centre at the start of 2017. He works in the packaging technology research team looking at sustainability and at opportunities to collaborate with external organisations. Ricky, really looking forward to your presentation. It's over to you. Thanks, Russell. Uh, let's get the share on the go. Right, uh, Russell has done a fair bit of my introduction for me, which is good. Um, Yep, so I've, I've been in menstrual for about, for coming up to four years now. Um, what I'm going to talk about today, I'm going to talk about Diageo's global strategy for sustainability and, and for some kind of societal aspects. I'm going to talk about targets getting released in 2030. So I'm, uh, I, can't, I don't have those, but I'll talk about some of the themes that I think they'll touch upon. As Russell said, I'm a material scientist, so I'll talk about some of the material challenges that I see. Um, 
bio-based packaging opportunities. I've got some ideas, but I suspect there's other people on this call who have much more. So I'm genuinely interested to hear what feedback I get. And then, yeah, I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. Uh, like most large companies, uh, Diageo have some big global statements. This is our performance ambition. Our performance ambition is to be one of the best performing, most trusted and respected consumer products companies in the world. The um, arrows round about that are our must-dos and how we're going to try to get there. Uh, some of them are, are, are about efficiency and uh, quality growth. And in the sit middle circle there, uh, in the bottom arrow, there's pioneer grain to glass sustainability. Uh, we've done a lot of work so far, but we completely recognize that we have plenty more work to do. We wrote 2020 targets in 2007. Uh, they have been updated a few times. I think the major last update was in 2015. Uh, some of the targets we have uh, top right of the screen here, we've been looking to cut our greenhouse gas emissions across our, our sites. Uh, we're trying to improve our water return, uh, trying to make sure as much of our recycling packaging is recyclable as possible. From our own sites, not to send too much to landfill. We've got a few education programs, one for the people who can drink, telling them uh, not to drink too much, and one for the people who are too young to drink, telling them they shouldn't be drinking. Uh, we also have, uh, yeah, we've also got other com community programs out there. Uh, in terms of some of our results so far, these results are from 2019, uh, rather than the end of 2020. We don't have our 2020 results, I suspect they'll be announced reasonably shortly. Um, our targets were quite quite far reaching, we felt. Um, so we um, most of them were, well, were reasonably well on course for, if not necessarily hitting. Uh, there's a couple of exceptions there, and that's some of the water supplies in uh, water stressed areas and returning wastewater. So whilst we, those have improved a fair bit, we recognize we have work to do to try and push those forward in the next few years. Our greenhouse gas emissions, uh, over the, since 2007, they've reduced by 44.7% in our direct sites, uh, approaching the target at 50%. For, 30, uh, for our supply chain, so we're looking at suppliers and, and getting it to the customers, uh, the, the target was 30%, which we're approaching. Line six here is, is my world, you know, this is where I work. Uh, our packaging weights, we've reduced by coming up to 11%, so it's not hitting that 15, but hopefully we can get there. It's uh, recycled content, uh, it, we've been increasing and we've increased it to 40.5%. And we're trying to make sure as much of our packaging is recyclable as possible. I think just now it's 98.7%. And for ourselves, we're trying to send as little to a landfill as possible. We're, I don't think we send too much landfill in Scotland. I uh, suspect some of perhaps overseas markets, we account for that 3.8%. So still work to do. In terms of highlights from our F19 figures, our 2019 figures, uh, they, I, I won't go through all of these, but we, we have our Join the Pact, which is trying to encourage people to not drink and drive, not that they should necessarily need encouraging. We've had a lot of sign-ups to that. Uh, we've got a few, few programs in Africa where we're trying to help farmers, trying to get safe water to people. Um, we had a target of 38% of our senior managers to be women. Uh, right now that figure is 36%. Um, yeah, and a bit of education programs. Coming over to this right hand side, uh, we have some feedback here, which is reasonably encouraging. We're getting recognized by CDP, by Dow Jones, and the Cranfield School of Management to recognize we are trying in this field. Not that we're complacent about the work that needs to get done. In terms of uh, light weighting, I discussed a little bit of light weighting there. Uh, we just got a case study in this slide of, of our Smirnoff 1.75 litre bottle in the States. It uh, used to have a handle on it. No great need for a handle. It's uh, nice to have, but uh, it doesn't have a great function. By removing that handle, we've reduced the weight of the bottle by 137 grams. Uh, by the time you multiply that up by the 8 million bottles that we've sold of that, you can turn it into numbers of planes and, and buses but I don't usually do that myself, but the numbers are up there. Recycled content, um, our Guinness cans are around about 50% recycled content, and our Gordon's glass is about 81%, I'll call it, used in that. Um, so, yeah, our green glass, you can actually get higher than that if the colour's available. Uh, clear's not as straightforward. Clear, you start hitting quality issues around about 40% recycled, and amber's between those two figures. 
Um, right, sorry, I'm, I'm getting messages from my boss here, which is unhelpful. Right, keep, keep it on moving. Um, we, we, so our new targets for 2030 are going to get announced in November. Uh, in 2018, we announced some, some targets with regards to plastics. Um, we're certainly looking to get 100% of our plastics by 25 to be recyclable, reusable, or compostable, although I recognise some of David's remarks with our concerns with composting. We're trying to get our, by 25, we're trying to get our recycled content in our plastic bottles to up to 40% and 100% by 2030. And I think that 100% will be incredibly challenging or very difficult to do. We're looking to invest in circular economy opportunities, like the one that Martin was talking about, and that, um, like Martin's system is, 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 is impressive. Uh, and we're looking for other sustainable packaging breakthroughs as well. Uh, we're looking to increase collaboration and recycling with governments, peers, consumers, and also with the recycling companies themselves. I've got my guesses at the 2030 targets at the bottom of this slide here, but the next slide is one that was presented to some of our customers, sorry, by some of, to some of our suppliers a couple of weeks ago, which touches on the themes. Um, once again, acknowledging it'll be November, we're looking at launching, they'll be aligned with UN sustainability development goals. Plastic waste and uh, global warming are going to be as important as ever or more important than ever. It'll be 10 year strategy. We'll be looking on building upon some of our work that I've discussed so far, continuing the themes of positive drinking, diversity and grain to glass sustainability. And we're hoping to use our brands to actually shape the conversation. We would like to be ahead of any legislation rather than chasing after it. And we want to involve our partners, whether that's suppliers, customers or employees to be involved in that change. Right. The last couple of slides were quite pretty. This one isn't. This is one that I made. Uh, but it's kind of close to where I work. These are some of the things I see as packaging challenges. Um, I like glass. I, I like, I like my, my drink in a glass bottle, but, but glass has to, whilst it's very recyclable, it's got the challenge that it's got a larger carbon footprint than paper, plastic, and aluminium. So the question tonight for you is, can we reduce that footprint? Uh, quite a large part of that footprint comes from the furnaces that are used to make the glass. They're mostly fossil fuel just now. If the fueling can change to possibly a biofuel, or, or a hydrogen or an electric furnace, potentially using renewables, that would have the potential to reduce that footprint. If our bottles can get a coating, that means we can lightweight them further, that would reduce the footprint as well. Obviously, the glass furnaces are difficult to do because they, they're very expensive and they generally get replenished or renewed once every 25 years. So it's a difficult thing to change. And, and, and obviously, our suppliers are the ones who will be looking at that, but, but we want to get involved in it too because it obviously has a knock-on effect to us. In our figures. In terms of plastics, the majority of our plastics, only 5% of our packaging is uh, only 5% of our packaging is uh, plastic and of that 5%, the majority of that is PET bottles which are fairly recyclable. Um, but we do use non-return valves and tamper evidence in international markets, some, some specific markets where there's problems with bootlegging and counterfeiting and refill. Uh, we can't really allow our bottles to be used by by other people. Uh, there's not so much necessarily our brands, but it's only in cases globally where, where alcohol bottles being filled with a poor quality bootleg that's created health issues for the person who's consumed it. So we need to make sure we discourage any refill as much as possible. And that's where those valves get used. Now, there, there can be a, can be plastics and typically there's plastics in those. How do we get to 100% recycled content in our plastic bottles? You know, just now we're, we're not particularly high in that figure and there's plenty of other companies looking for that statement and looking to hit that target. I think availability is going to be a challenge. A lot of post-consumer PET doesn't necessarily go into food grade plastics. It can quite often go into, uh, can be downcycled into other bottles. But uh, it's going to be a challenge to get that 100% in terms of availability, in terms of keeping the quality up and, and what's the cost of getting there. So it's 10 year list, but it's going to be a challenge. Where can we go with circularity? Uh, we do a little bit of refill in, in bottles in Africa, beer bottles in Africa and Brazil. Don't do a huge amount of it. There's a scheme that's been launched by a company called Loop that we are not a part of, and I don't want to give the impression that we are, but uh, it's, it's an interesting scheme. Uh, Carrefour in Paris, Tesco in London, and, and uh, some American retailers where you order your products that get delivered to the house in refillable components and then it, uh, packaging, and then it gets returned and refilled. So it's interesting. So let's say we aren't a part of that just now, but, but schemes like that would definitely appeal to us. Can we do more to improve our packs recyclability? Um, can we use monomaterial packaging solutions? Our bottles are, are fairly monomaterial with sort of things on there, but some of our 
gift sets and cartons historically have, have had multiple materials in them and haven't been optimal for recycling. So we, we, there's definitely room for improving there. Can we use some biodegradable materials? Over COVID, like a lot of companies, uh, we've, we've been impacted by that negatively uh, due to the on, on sales trade. Uh, but uh, on the other side, that the e-commerce has risen a fair bit on alcohol. Now that's got an issue that, that uh, your e-commerce uses a fair bit more packaging, a lot more packaging, usually third parties who do that for us. But we want to make sure that when we're, if that extra packaging is required for e-commerce, that we've got a good control over that and it's and it he heading in the right direction. And then what other new technologies are out there to help our supply chain and brands? Turning that over into bio-based packaging opportunities. My first line there is pretty much an acknowledgement that I'm not an expert in bio-based packaging opportunities. I, I, I know some, but I'd really like to know what's out there and, and I'm completely open to discussion on that at a later date. But some of the things I'm thinking of is can we, we use a lot of pallet wrap, or we, <laughs> we, use, we use some pallet wrap. So can we do more with that to reduce its footprint? Are any counterfeit closures, can we reduce the footprint of the plastics in those? Can we use more sustainable feedstock, both for the glass furnaces, for our suppliers or for our plastics? And what can we do with the e-commerce packaging to make sure that's, that's got as little impact as possible? A couple of case studies to finish off with. We are, this got announced a couple of months ago. We're releasing it next year. Uh, it's, it's the world's first plastic-free paper-based spirit bottle. Uh, so there are paper bottles out there already, but, but quite a lot of paper bottles out there. I've got plastic linings, or they've got aluminium linings. So we're trying to get the plastic free element, we're trying to get plastic out of that. Uh, Johnny Walker is going to be the brand that it's launched with. Uh, we're in partnership with a company called Pilot Light. Uh, the, to, and the, company's, and the pump, company making that bottle is called Pulpex. Uh, the bottle's renewable, recyclable, and it's PET free with a low carbon footprint. The intention is that it shouldn't be uh, after when it's uh, developed a bit, and we, if we make more of these, then it shouldn't be much, it shouldn't be expensive to make either. And we've got a couple of big FMCGs interested in this as well, with Unilever and PepsiCo. So we're not doing this on our own. Uh, my team was uh, heavily involved with this, uh, albeit I wasn't. But uh, so my team did uh, some great work in that, getting out of the ground. A lot of material challenges. That's something that that Dana uh, touched upon at the start. Is is that when you start bringing in different materials, all of a sudden, what's historically strong and suitable and what we expect might not necessarily be there. So we have to make sure that we are, that these bottles are still fit for purpose for the supply chain. And one last one, Seedlip is a company that we got, bought a controlling share of a couple of years ago. They, they make non-alcoholic beverages. Um, whilst my team had a lot to do with the paper bottle, my team had nothing to do with this. Seedlip must have their own materials, guys, but they basically worked on a, on a gift box that's made out of mushroom roots. So it's quite interesting. The idea is the gift box, you can get your your drink and your and your glass home with you, and then the, the box will go away for compost. Um, so yeah, that's the end of my presentation. So thanks very much for listening. Uh, happy to engage in any discussions. If the, uh, we're running a bit late, so I have to leave at half three, so I'm not sure how long into the uh, question and answer session I will be there for, but I will, um, but yeah, I will answer any questions later if we don't get to them today. Yeah. So thanks again. Thank you very much, Ricky. That's fantastic. Really interesting presentation. Uh, okay, so we'll move on to our next speaker, who's Charlie Bavington from Oceanium. As way of introduction, Charlie graduated with a PhD in biochemistry from the University of Edinburgh in 1996. And uh, after a couple of initial uh, appointments, he founded Glycomar in 2005. Glycomar are involved in the discovery and development of high value polysaccharide and carbo carbohydrate products for a range of different applications. From 2014 to 2019, Charlie was director of the Seaweed Association. And in 2018, he became the CTO of Oceanium. And I think that is where he's going to direct his presentation today. So Charlie, it's over to you. Yeah, thanks, Russell. And uh, thank you for this invitation. And I'm just going to share my screen. Nice to see some uh, friendly names on the participant list. Hello to everyone that I know, and uh, nice to meet people I haven't. Um, I've been very happy to follow up after this. So I'm going to tell you in 10 minutes about Oceanium. Um, hopefully you can see my screen okay. Um, 
So we're very much a startup founded in the summer of 2018 um, and been developing products now um, just for just over a year. We, we set up the company when I, meet, when I met my co-founder, Karen Schofield Seal, really to address the, the packaging problem uh, and primarily the packaging with no end of life solution, which uh, arguably David would say is all, all plastic packaging, but um, really looking to address the problem of, of packaging plastic packaging with no end of, of life solution, particularly food packaging, single use food packaging. And, and Karen came to me, um, she's an entrepreneur with interested in sustainability with an interest to, to achieve that using seaweed. She'd done a lot of research on seaweed as a, as a material. Um, I knew straight away that that wouldn't work economically because of the cost of seaweed and the cost of processing seaweed. And so we, from day, almost day one, realized that we needed to develop by biorefinery approach that addressed two of our big challenges, both the um, problem of single use packaging, um, and secondly, the demand for sustainable and healthy food and the, the food crisis that the planet is facing. And that's where we started on our journey, which we're very much in the early stages of. So Oceanium is developing food products and biopackaging materials from sustainably farmed seaweed. And we, to date, only work with farm seaweed and our intention is always to work with farm seaweed uh, because of the sustainability arguments for that, um, especially when you move to scale, wild harvest um, is not viable. And why is seaweed such a great uh, biomaterial? Um, there are plenty of other biomaterials out there in the world, which we all know very well. Um, but if you look at seaweed uh, as, a, as a material, um, it sequesters carbon, uh, like all plants. It sequesters nitrogen in the ocean where eutrophication is a huge problem from nitrate runoff. It provides marine protection, um, so enhancing biodiversity. Um, it's a great healthy food, as I've said. And when you compare it to uh, terrestrial sources of biomass, uh, there's no cleared land, no deforestation required. Um, there's no insecticide, no fertilizer. It's a zero input crop. Um, and it uses no fresh water. Uh, and of course, alongside that, we're creating jobs. So there's, there's a social impact often in coastal communities uh, which are distressed. So we believe it's the ultimate sustainable um, raw material with lots of potential. And uh, going back to our, our um, business model, which is really in a nutshell on this slide, we sit in the middle of the value chain. So we take um, whole farmed, fresh farmed seaweed, um, which has been farmed at scale. And we take that into our coastal biorefinery and we extract maximum value with minimum waste generation. Um, and we do that by creating multiple products, which include protein and fiber food ingredients, um, high value nutraceutical products, which are primarily polysaccharides, but also some minerals and vitamins, and then a, a lower value biopackaging material. And so, um, although this is, this is a, a webinar about packaging, we're really very much a, a processing and biorefinery business. And packaging is a thing that we've had to learn about fast by talking to people like David. And it's a thing that we are in the early stages of development with, as I'll show you. I just want to give some historical context because uh, for Scotland. Um, so these are some pictures of a seaweed processing plant in the west of Scotland in the 1930s, just down the coast from me in Argyll, um, processing kelp um, uh, on the Argyll coast, um, making primarily for alginate production, so the, the colloid industry, which used to be in Scotland. So it's not a new thing to process seaweed. And if you look back in the patent, um, patent history, there's actually a patent filed in the late 30s for a packaging film made from seaweed called seafoil. Um, and there's a, the engineering drawing. So, so, and again, that came out of Scotland. So, that, so there's, a, there's a fascinating history of seaweed processing in Scotland, um, which goes back even further than that, and a history of, of seaweed use in materials, um, which, uh, which is quite interesting. I won't go into the rest of that story, but it's, if you look it up, it's quite an interesting story. Sorry for that little aside there, but it's good to, to have a historical context and realize there's nothing new under the sun. Our products then are biopackaging um, materials, food and nutrition products, uh, and some future products. Our biopacking packaging material is a film and a board, as I'm gonna show you in a little, a little bit more detail in a minute. 
Um, it's um, a marine safe product, so if it leaks into the ocean, it will biodegrade. It's home compostable, uh, and of course, industrial compostable and, and anaerobic digestible. Um, it's a branded product, so we're calling it Oceanware because we want to explain to consumers uh, the story of its origin, its sustainability, and what to do with it. Um, uh, alongside that, we have food nutrition products, so protein, fiber, and um, health supplements, which are, of course, highly sustainable, healthy, and have a great provenance. Um, and we have future development in, in more in the health and medical sphere. So our packaging material then um, looks like this. We're, as I said, in the early stages of development. Um, very happy to have just secured um, following follow on funding from Innovate UK to move on to um, industrial scale processing um, of, our, of the material. Um, so the material, um, we, make a, we make a brown powder, which uh, we've extracted from the seaweed after we've taken all these other things out. That material can be converted into a board, uh, what, what we call a board. That's intended to be molded into food trays um, and a film, a clear film, which would be a, a film for packaging food. Um, I've got a little video, hopefully, which will run here just to show you what the film looks like. As I say, this is a prototype. There's little bubbles in it. It's not perfect. But it's a flexible film, which is, uh, which would be edible, of course, but um, it certainly is completely compostable. Uh, and similarly with our board material, um, so this this is uh, this is uses more of the components in the seaweed, um, and makes a stiffer, harder material, which can be molded into trays. Um, as you can see, it's it actually has quite a kind of leathery consistency. Um, and these are first generation products. So we, we do have a plan to um, move beyond these and um, to uh, develop second generation products with, with a bit more chemistry involved. Um, our USP then is, is our processing technology. We are, we are a biorefinery company uh, and our, our know-how is really tra trade secret, proprietary know-how around processing. We are also developing patents around our um, product formulations. The biorefinery approach, I think, is, is a wonderful one for seaweed. Um, it's the only one that works to make it commercially viable, but it also is very flexible because you have multiple end markets and you can pivot to demand. So you can, you can switch your focus between different markets as demand. Um, and then we have the um, first mover in this nascent seaweed farming industry. So, there is a huge interest in seaweed farming around the world. Um, obviously, seaweed farming is, is huge in Asia already with some 24 million tons of seaweed farmed in, in uh, China, Korea, the Philippines. But it's a nascent industry in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, people are getting into it, but they have no market because we don't eat seaweed the same, uh, to the same level as is eaten in Asia. And so there is a, there is a need for a processing um, demand to turn seaweed into products that we want in the Western Hemisphere and we are providing that and we're we're among very few companies providing that. Uh, we've been well supported through our startup phase both from uh, venture capital from Catapult Ocean and Sky Ocean Ventures and grants. Um, we have four grants for Innovate UK including a new one to take our packaging material onto industrial machines to solve the conversion problems of that. Um, and we work with partners including CPI, and IBIC and others in Zero Waste Scotland. We're very appreciative of all the support that we've had, which we wouldn't have got as far as we had without that. And finally, um, Oceanium very much is an impact business. It was set up for environmental and social impact. And we, we actively track that and we're looking to mitigate climate change and ensure, ensure food security right across the value ch chain. And, and also create jobs in coastal communities where there's a need to shift from um, less sustainable activities such as um, fishing. And I want to end on this side. This is our vision. We have a big vision. We're a startup, but we believe we can be processing in 10 locations in seven countries by 2030. We put dots on maps where we're having conversations with large scale seaweed farmers um, who want to grow seaweed in the multi in, in the thousands of tons per annum. And our unit operation is a 50,000 ton factory at full scale. Uh, and we're looking for seaweed farmers that have that vision to move seaweed farming to that scale. 
um, and also locations where the governments are supportive of that kind of um, scale of seaweed farming because there's a lot of licensing issues of course. Um, we're very very much excited of course to be starting out in Scotland and we will have an operation in Scotland we're scaling up over the next year up to 100 tons next year um, but also looking at other European locations in Norway and the Faroes um, and then looking over to the west coast of the US, Chile and, and locations in Asia. So I'll, I'll stop there and I'll be happy to answer any questions later and you can find my contact details on that slide. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. Fantastic presentation there. And I'm sure there'll be some really uh, interesting questions for you at the, at the end. So now move on to our final speaker, Matthew Reeves. Matthew is Knowledge Transfer Manager for Materials, Chemistry and Formulation at KTN. And he has a master's degree in chemical physics and a PhD in soft matter from the University of Edinburgh, graduating in 2016. Matthew continued his career working at the university industry interface as a postdoc researcher at Edinburgh Complex Fluids Partnership before moving on to KTN in early 2019. Matthew, it's over to you. Thanks, Russell, for the introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so right now, I'm going to share with you some information that's been kindly passed to me by the team at the Smart Sustainable Plastic Packaging Challenge, um, as well as highlight some uh, relevant KTN activity in, in this important area of sustainable materials. Um, so for this first bit, I'll introduce the SSPP uh, challenge um, and focus on a recent area of interest for them um, in low carbon non-fossil polymers for packaging applications um, and then finish up with uh, the funding opportunity. So for those of you not already aware, the SSPP challenge is run uh, by Innovate UK, we've heard them mentioned a couple of times already. Um, so Innovate UK itself is part of UKRI, uh, which is the umbrella body for the various domain specific funding councils across the UK. Um, that are funded through the UK Treasury. Um, this particular funding challenge is, is through the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund and was uh, set up in 2019. Um, it's due to run for five years until 2024 um, with a £60 million pot of money split between three stages of uh, innovation, um, namely the, the early stage uh, enabling research uh, with around £8 million allocated um, collaborative R&D with £12 million um, and large-scale demonstrator projects are getting the lion's share of this funding uh, to the tune of about £38 million. Um, the scope of this fund is around the three R's, uh, so this is reduce, uh, reuse and recycle, um, noting that a fourth R being um, recovery uh, is not covered uh, under this particular fund. Um, so instead of coming up with a, a brand new set of targets to use to measure progress for SSPP, um, they adopted some pre-existing targets at the time, um, which was set by the UK Plastics Pact. Um, and these are to aim for 100% of plastic packaging to be either reusable, recyclable or compostable. 70% um, of plastic packaging uh, to be effectively recycled or composted. 30% um, average recycled content uh, in the plastic packaging itself, um, and also to, to take actions on eliminating problematic or unnecessary single-use packaging. Um, and this is this all with the target of doing this by 2025. Um, so it's worth noting here uh, that, of course, these are relatively short-term um, targets um, in light of um, the, the, the sort of net zero uh, targets of uh, 2045 and 2050. Um, these will be revisited in, in uh, five years' time, but they are quite stretching nonetheless, um, and they are actually galvanising a lot of activity and attention to these issues. Um, there's, there's no sort of carbon dioxide emission targets set uh, in, in, these, in these targets. Um, and so SSPP, as it was originally formulated, wasn't really set up to contribute to, to the net zero um, agenda. Uh, however, um, the team at SSPP have been uh, exploring what net zero means for the plastic sector and how to get the UK on track to decarbonise its um, supply chain uh, and maximise the value derived um, from polymers whilst retaining the sustainability benefits that um, some plastics do, do offer. 
um, because of course the, the plastics that are inefficient often lower carbon material choice than some others. Um, it's particularly effective at protecting uh, food and light weighting vehicles, for example. Um, the biggest use of, of plastics is, is in packaging, uh, about 40% around the world. Um, it's an important industry for the UK um, and the UK government likes, um, uh, often looks at the plastic se sector as a good indicator of what's happening um, with manufacturing and, and export, exporting in the UK. Um, additionally, there's likely to be continuous growth in the demand um, for, for plastics, particularly in Middle East and Africa. Um, plastics production currently forms around 17% of the carbon budget that we need to stick to limit global warming to the 1.5 degrees um, set by, the, um, by the, the, the Commission on Climate Change. Um, it doesn't sound like a lot, but we, we don't think that society will want to use this percentage of the global carbon budget on plastics. Um, However, there's currently some resistance in the system to the, to the scale of system change needed to decarbonize um, plastics production. Um, and the story is similar for the majority of, of other uh, sort of um, big bulky materials. Um, in the UK, it's not that an exciting place to put large assets and large petrochemical companies are not really looking to invest in major infrastructure due to the limited growth and potential of these. Um, so what the SSPP team is trying to understand um, is basically these, these three questions on this slide that we'll hopefully come to in the, in the panel discussion if we have enough time. Um, they, they want to understand how we're going to manufacture these next generation materials in a sustainable manner. Um, and so now we come to hopefully the, ju the juiciest slide of them all uh, for everyone on the call, where, where the money is. Um, so first up, we have the future plastic uh, packaging solutions call, um, which will be two million pounds uh, for either individual or collaborative applications uh, with grants in the region of 50k to 150k. This is going to open on the 26th of October uh, and close on the 20th of January next year. Um, there's a briefing event for this on the 3rd of November, um, so I encourage you to sign up to that to find out more and find out um, who's looking at getting involved with that. Um, then there's also these, these two other um, elements, the collaborative R&D call. Um, there will be one coming up shortly, but that's yet to be announced. Um, and then there's the large scale demonstrators call, uh, which is coming up um, very shortly as well. Um, and this is particularly uh, targeting the areas of uh, reuse, refill, um, biopolymers and food grade recyclable polypropylene. Um, so just to finish off, I'd like to just uh, highlight some relevant activity um, at KTN and um, slightly beyond. Um, so KTN runs the UK Circular Plastics Network, UK CPN, um, which is a great place to find collaborators and stay up to date with what's going on uh, with everything plastic. Um, so I'd encourage you, if you're not already on that, to register for that. Um, the chemistry and IB team at KTN is, is also running a, a net zero chemicals manufacturing series with up, upcoming sessions on um, biomass valorization on the 20th of October, um, waste polymers as a feedstock on 24th November, um, concluding with a, a project brokerage event on the 15th of December. Um, more information on that is on our website. Um, uh, and also just this week saw the launch of the National Packaging Innovation Centre, um, housed within the Centre for Process Innovation, CPI. Um, this is going to be based in Liverpool, um, and um, Unilever are, are one of the, the founding partners uh, for this. Um, so what they're looking to do is to create a place where companies can go to accelerate their research and development of packaging solutions. Um, so it's not, just, it's not just the materials, it's, it's everything from the materials to the systems, uh, and even touching on aspects of um, consumer uh, behaviour change. Um, and um, finally, we, we also have our SME Accelerator Scheme, which was launched this month. Um, and it's looking for applications from investment-hungry, small and medium-sized enterprises um, that have chemical or industrial biotechnology solutions um, for, the, for the net zero world that we all think um, we should be living in in about 30 years' time. Um, applications for this close on the 30th of September. So if you're interested in this, I'd suggest you move quickly and if you think there's anyone that you know that could be interested in that please feel free to to, to make them aware of it um so yeah if you've heard anything that you would like to find out more information um 
feel free to get in touch with us. I've got the links there. Uh, they'll be on. Uh, they'll be in the slide pack that will get distributed. Uh, and our email addresses are on the screen there, and links to the websites, etc. So, um, with that, I'll hand back to Russell. Um, thanks, Matthew. Or Donna. That's fine. No worries. So I know we are slightly overrunning. Um, if there are any questions you would like to ask our panelists, please do now. Maybe we can have another extra five minutes for any. Um, can, I, can I just uh, say something, um, Dana? Uh, I really appreciated the, the, the presentation of Charlie and also the gentleman from the Adjo um, uh, looking at uh, compostable materials. It's, it's, it's good. Um, so to make those materials work, we need to compost them. I mean, this sounds pretty obvious, but it's not to everybody. Um, and therefore, you need to actually collect them. Um, so you need to get them to a compost plant. Um, so if, you, if you're talking to your policymakers and you're talking to your, you know, your council officers and you're talking to your Zero Waste Scotland, uh, the very simple thing they need to do is adopt an article of the, of the European Circular Economy Package and the Waste Framework Directive, which says that councils should collect compostable materials with food waste and send them to composting. Otherwise, Charlie's going to be making these beautiful materials, which you're paying him a shed load of money to, to, to research, and they're all going to end up in an incinerator or a landfill. Well, that's not the point. They should end up in composting, and they should help the materials they contain, or the, or the food waste they contain, go back to soil. But to do that, you need to make sure councils collect it. So the one most important thing you can do when you finish this webinar is you can write a letter to your environment minister saying, dear minister, we must have the collection of food waste, allowing the collection of compostable packaging with it. You already have compostable packaging recycled in Scotland. Keenan, Keenan uh, Recycle do it very well. They have a big compost plant there. So you can do this. You have the infrastructure to do it. You have the collections. That's the one simple thing you can do if you want to make Charlie's business thrive. Thank you, David. Yeah, totally agree. Yeah, I mean, because coming from Germany, you know, we have that in Germany actually that the food waste is getting collected regularly, it's part of our recycling system. Sure, we'll, we'll have it across the whole EU and across the whole UK by 2023, and, and countries are introducing it even from next year, 2021. You know, and, and the trouble is here we here we have this move away from unrecyclable plastics to materials that can be recycled through organic recycling. But if we don't collect them and we don't get them to organic recycling, we're all really wasting our time. Um, and we may as well carry on making recycled, uh, unrecyclable plastics and throw them in an incinerator, which is what somebody, what a lot of people actually want to continue to happen. Um, but you know, people like Charlie and people that you're financing through these, these uh, government and our taxpayers' money well, actually, their materials deserve the right future. They deserve to go back to soil. Yeah. Yeah, totally agree, um, David. Yeah. We got some questions for Charlie. I don't know. Charlie, can you see them? Do you want to take... Where are they? In the questions? chat or in the Q&A? In the Q&A box. So the first one is around your marine safe statement. And the question is how long it takes to break down in the marine environment. Um, and under what condition it has been tested. So it's, um, it's, it's a few weeks, um, de depending on which material you're talking about. So it's two to three weeks. Um, we've just tested it at ambient temperature in, in normal sea water. So it's not been done scientifically, but it's done, been done empirically by me. I've stuck, stuck our products in seawater and they do break down and biodegrade and disappear. Um, which can makes I just, sense, can I, right? It's seaweed. Yeah. Yeah. Can I just add there, Charlie? Um, you know, we, we get this question all the time. Oh, if it's compostable, then it must break down in the sea. Yeah. Well, <laughs> actually, it's made to be composted. It's not made to be thrown in the ocean or down a river. It's made to actually be part of a waste um, collection system and a waste treatment system. But it, but it is an important point, especially for, you know, we're going to operate in developing countries where a lot of plastics leak into the, the ocean through rivers. Sure. And, and materials like PLA, while they're compostable, they're not marine biodegradable. So it's an important distinction that, that it's marine safe. It may be not so important in, in, 
developed world, but certainly it's important in other countries. Okay. Yeah, and the second question is around what kind of consideration have been made um, around the infrastructure of the compostable package? Um, I think David's already addressed that. I mean, it's, it's really designed to go into the food waste stream. So, um, as I said, it, it, it is an edible material if it, you know, if it met food hygiene requirements. So it's really designed to go into the food waste stream. It'll be covered in food anyway, um, and it's designed to go into the food waste stream. So, so having a, a working food waste recycling system is, is absolutely vital. Good. And, and there, it's worth mentioning there's a couple of other companies, uh, in Notla, um, used to be called yeah. Rocks, um, who, who make um, seaweed-based packaging. Um, and um, um, Lollyware in the US, um, and a couple in, in France, um, Algopac um, and Aeronova. So, so hopefully that some of these guys will be our customers. They'll buy our brown biomaterial and turn it into their packaging products because uh, we don't want to be a converter. Yeah. yeah, can I just add there that it's a, it's a common myth um, and, and it's a myth put around by people who don't want to see uh, companies like Charlie's succeed because they fear the competition, that there is actually no composting going on in the UK. Well, actually, that's complete nonsense. The uh, composting industry in the UK treated 6 million tonnes of garden waste and about three or 400,000 tonnes of food waste uh, this year, and about another two or three million tonnes of, of agricultural waste. Uh, there are 300 compost plants across the UK. It's the biggest waste collection, waste treatment infrastructure we have, bigger than the packaging industry. You wouldn't know it, would you? Because if you read every report, it's, oh, there's no infrastructure. It's nonsense. What there is not is the route between households and consumers back to the infrastructure. And that's what food waste collections provide. Okay. Um, any other questions from our attendees or... Matthew and um, Russell, do you have anything you would like to ask? No, nothing from me, Dana, thank you. Okay. So if there are none, then I would like to close the meeting. Um, thank you to our speakers. I think really interesting discussion points, really interesting talks. And um, yeah, we will be sharing the presentations uh, relatively soon. Thank you guys. Have a good evening. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks.